The matchup we've been waiting for all season long. Skyview and Union. See who claims the top spot in the GSHL. Plus, we check in with the Storm Volleyball team to see how they're spiking their way through the league. And a visit from Micah Rice of the Columbian. Oh, one more thing. This episode? Yeah, it's, it's real special. It's time for Clark County Scoreboard. Hello and welcome to Clark County Scoreboard, I'm Brian Slyke. It doesn't get much bigger than Union versus Skyview on a Friday night. Both teams ranked in the top 10 in the state. The winner sits in the driver's seat for the 4A league title. Let's go out to Kiggins Bowl where the Skyview faithful came out in full force. After the coin flip, Union gets the ball first and it does not go well. Quarterback Mitch Radigan loses the grip on the ball as he tries to swing it out to the back. That's a backwards pass, a fumble, and it's recovered by the storm deep in Union territory. A couple of plays later, Skyview quarterback Nico Ariola keeps it himself and runs it into the end zone for the first score of the game. After another Union turnover, Fedja Heinrichs Tarasenkov drills the first of his three field goals on the night to give the Storm a 10-0 lead. Second quarter now, and senior tight end Tanner Beeman is forgotten about up the seam. It's an easy toss for Ariola, and Beeman goes the distance to put the Storm up 17-0. Right. Under 10 seconds left in the first half, and it's Heinrichs Tarasenkov again, giving the Storm a commanding 20 to nothing lead at the half. The good news kept coming at halftime as Skyview selected its homecoming queen. Back to the game with under two minutes left in the third, it's Ariola again on the keeper, putting Skyview ahead 30 to nothing. Union finally gets on the board in the fourth, though, on a spectacular catch and run from Jaden Jones. After the bobble, he turns on the Jets and goes full extension. He stretches out, going horizontal to break the plane, and Union avoids the goose egg. Skyview's main back, Jaden Knapp, says, I can do that too. As he runs 42 yards off tackle, Knapp had 149 yards rushing on the night. One last gasp for Union, but Gabe Martin wants in on the turnover party. That was the third pick of the night for the Storm defense, and Skyview wins a shocker, 37-7. It wasn't hard for the Storm players to get up for this game. Union Week's a huge deal. And like growing up, in, like coming up in the program, watching these guys play, my, the older guys I look up to, they take it so seriously. And, and, like, and I, I even told the younger guys, like, this week is special. Like, if I get a better look on that, on that second team that's running against me, it's going to help me fight or Thursday night. So, so yeah, it, it, really, it really helped. Uh, I mean, it's a big win. It's awesome. But at the end of the day, like I said, it's just another – just another game on our schedule. We're trying to get that league championship. We're trying to beat Camus and, I mean, thump them like this. We're not trying to just, you know, it, it'll be a battle, but we're trying to really take it to them and show them that we're the best team in this area. As you just heard, up next for the Storm, a visit to Camus. A win would mean their first outright league title in 10 years. Speaking of Camus, they took a trip up north to take on 2A's number one ranked team, Tumwater. Things started poorly for the papermakers. After the catch, the receiver fumbles it away on their first possession. Tumwater recovers, and they're in business. Two plays later, the Thunderbirds got on the board first on this Carlos Matheny run from one yard out. But Camus responds quickly. Taylor Yanni hits Mark Thorkelson. He pulls the old Ole move, catches a great block downfield, and he scampers in for the score from 60 yards out to tie the game up. Later in the first, Camus goes up on this one-yard touchdown run, and then it's Yanni to Thorkelson again, this time for 87 yards. Thorkelson outruns the defense and Camus outruns Tumwater. They went up 28 to seven and held on to win 28-26, remaining undefeated against Washington teams after an 0-4 start against teams from Oregon. Let's go back out to Kiggins Bowl where the Columbia River Rapids hosted the number two ranked Sputters of Ridgefield. And Ridgefield wasted little time getting on the board. Just over two minutes into the game, Davis Pankow gets the call from 25 yards out. He takes it off the right tackle, dances his way through with a little shake and bake, and finds the end zone. Minutes later, Columbia River quarterback Adam Watts works the play action to perfection. 
faking the handoff, planting his feet and dropping a dime on Victor Flores from 42 yards out. This game is tied at seven. The Ridgefield ground game could not be denied though. Here again, it's Pancow, this time from 35 yards out. He sheds a couple of wannabe tacklers and pulls away to give the Spartans a one touchdown advantage, 14 to seven at the half. When Columbia River crowned its homecoming queen, that was the last win of the night by someone at River. Ridgefield began to pull away with another rushing touchdown by some dude named Pankow going in for his third of the night. He takes it off the right tackle again and it's 21 to seven Ridgefield. On the ensuing kickoff, a huge mental error for the Rapids seals the deal. The kick is uncaught and the returner is confused about what to do. He leaves the ball alone as if it were a punt, but that's a live ball and the sputters leap all over it, gaining possession on the Rapids goal line. On the next play, Connor Della Martyr pushes it in for a sputter touchdown, 28 to seven Ridgefield. They'd add insult to injury later in the fourth as Ty Snyder hauls in this long pass to score. The final from Kiggins is 34 to seven as Ridgefield stays undefeated and River looks to try to make a late season push to capture one of the league's last playoff spots. McKenzie Stadium had some fun football matchups this week. Craig Burnback joins us now with all the highlights. Craig? Thanks, Brian, and we're going to start with some football with what was a huge road victory for Mountain View last Friday night. No, things were not easy at Prairie for the Thunder, but thanks to an experienced head coach who knows just what to say, when to say it, and how to say it, the Thunder are rumbling into the postseason with another league title. After two first-half turnovers and overall sloppy offensive play, Mountain View trailed at Prairie 8-7 at the half, and Thunder head coach Adam Matheson wasn't too happy. We had to snap out of it. To snap his team out of it, Coach Matheson did something a bit unmatheson like He got spirited in the locker room. Things happen in the locker room, and you, you got to challenge kids, but the reality is they're such great kids, and they, they have such a high ceiling of their potential. And to be, more not, to be super honest, it was probably me just pleading with them, going, I just, I so desperately want them to play at their ability level. And the Thunder rolled out into the third quarter with a new sense of urgency. They scored 10 straight points. Three on this Eli Warren field goal that just snuck over the goalpost. And it's good. Then to cap off the third quarter scoring, quarterback Mitch Johnson kept it and weaved his way in from 13 yards out to give Mountain View a nine-point lead. Obviously, in the third quarter, you actually feel pretty good at 17-8 to eight because I felt like our defense was playing really well. And the defense did play well all night long, causing Prairie issues. But the Falcons did soar into the end zone for a late score when Thor Stepina crossed the goal line. Touchdown! But special teams would slam the door as the onside kick from Prairie went Mountain View's way. But in the end, the most important moment of the game might have been Matheson's halftime speech. They responded and uh, they responded better than I thought because I felt, you know, later I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's kind of spirited. Um, and then as I talked to kids after the game, they're like, coach, that was great. And it's like, really? Like it was kind of exhausting and I didn't feel great about it, but um, evidently it was the right button. And pushing those right buttons led to a victory that secured the Thunder at least a share of the league title and a top seed in the playoffs. Well, at the end of the day, like we're a pretty grumpy crew for you know accomplishing some pretty good stuff and for our kids being really good hard-working committed kids um, at some point we have to take a deep breath and go okay like that's a positive accomplishment now that's five league titles in just six years for coach matheson and mountain view next up for the thunder a clash with struggling battleground and speaking of battleground they ran into a heritage team on friday night who was fresh off their first win of the season and hungry for a second the wolves would roar out to the lead as aiden miller will take the handoff and weave his way in untouched from 30 yards out but before the half, Battleground's going to find a way to tie things up on a quarterback sneak from Lethan Reynolds, Weisenborn, long name, got mad game. Second half, all heritage. The defense gets offensive. That's LaDamian McCord with the pick, and then he's going to get, 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 get gone for the six. But guess what? McCord not done. 
This time, he's going to do it on offense. He's left wide open, and that is not a good idea. But Khalil Osmond is smart enough to just loft it out there, and McCord just going to walk on in for the score. Finally, how about Osmond again, and how about Miller again? This time, Osmond's going to throw the picture-perfect pass to Miller for the score. Look out! Heritage won two in a row as they took down Battleground 27-10. The early game at McKenzie on Friday pitted Evergreen and Kelso, and Kelso looked good. Already up 7-3. Watch Hunter Latier. He's going to drop back and let loose a bomb. That lands in the hands of Zeke Smith, and it was 21-3. Evergreen's going to try to hang in on this one, and they're going to get a bomb of their own. Jaden Kreiss, he's going to find Jordan Peters, who's going to find the end zone, and Evergreen was down just 11. But on this night, Kelso would make all the right plays. How about a little razzle and dazzle? The old end around to Colby Cooper who finds Pater and Kelso finds himself with a 42 to 10 victory. Let's jump on over to volleyball where on Tuesday night Kelso jumped up a division to 4A to take on Union but they prove why they're one of the best teams in 3A as they found a way to leave the Titans gym with a well-deserved win. Now this would be a battle and Kelso would start off red hot watching Natalie Fraley come in from the side flying in for the slam and the point. Kelso took sets one and two, but Union found a rhythm in game three. Watch Mallory Stokes with the sweet touch. Well done. That's a point. Union took that set 25-18. They got it done in set four as well. Look at the blocks from Ruby Ochoa and Eliana Bills getting big over there. But in the fifth set, it's Kelso stepping up. That's Emily Thompson with the serve for the winner and the victory. Kelso takes it in five sets. Now this week, EPS Sports will be back broadcasting some soccer on Thursday night as we'll show you Union vs. Mountain View as they square off in a rivalry game that's always fun. You can check out all the action on Evergreen Public Schools' YouTube channel. And of course, we'll be right back here next week on the Clark County Scoreboard to share more highlights and stories from across the EPS sports world. But for now, for Evergreen Public Schools, I'm Craig Birnbeck. I'll send it back to you at VPS. Thanks, Craig. Let's head out to Fort Vancouver, where the Trappers hosted arch rival Hudson's Bay for a 2A girls volleyball matchup. Fort won their first matchup this year and Bay hoped to even the score. As you can see, it was a pink out to support breast cancer awareness. Bay showed a lot of toughness in the first set. Coming back after getting down behind a great service run from Peyton Ballard, they take set one in a nail biter, 26-24. That loss woke up the Trappers. The new VPS superintendent, Jeff Snell, showed up to join the broadcast, and in set two, he saw the Trappers jump out to an early lead and hold on. They served strong all night long, forcing several errors by the Eagles. After another comeback by Bay, Fort holds on to win 25-18. Fort tightened their grip in sets three and four, winning 25-16 and 25-7. A fun night at the Trap and a sweep for Fort Vancouver over their main rivals. Now over to Columbia River High School, where the number two ranked Rapids hosted R.A. Long. It was a pink out there too, to support breast cancer survivors and research. The Rapids players rocked their pink jerseys too. River imposed its will early, up 3-1 in the first set. Riley Reeve does what she does best, dropping the hammer at the net. Later, River does it again, ending this game point rally with a big kill that the Lumberjacks can't keep in bounds. River takes the first set 25-12. They would take set number two, 25 to five, on this ace. On to the third set, and the Rapids are on cruise control. They take home the easy set win, 25 to 12, sweeping the Lumberjacks. The Rapids have only lost three sets all season long, and their only loss of the year is to number one Ridgefield, who they're facing again on Thursday. We go up I-5 to Battleground, where the Tigers hosted Heritage for a 4A matchup. This was an epic battle. It went five sets as Heritage took the first set in a squeaker, 25-21. Kiana Salovea had a huge night, finishing with 25 kills, seven blocks, and 26 digs for Heritage. Set two was the same score, but Battleground took this one. Set three, believe it or not, was also 25-21 with Heritage coming out on top. Set four was down to the wire, with the Tigers winning 26-24 and in the final set, Heritage held on to win 15 to 11. They take the match three sets to two. One of the most exciting volleyball teams this season is the Skyview Storm. 
They're looking at state this season in large part due to outstanding play from their upperclassmen. Joining us now is Skyview coach Shelby Swanson. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So I want to jump into when you first took over the program in 2018. The team was sort of in the middle of the pack, but since you got there, you helped change things around. What do you think you did that really elevated them? Um, coming from a being at Skyview when it was an elite program, I had high hopes of trying to get it back to where it was. Um, so I got back onto our basics of making a whole program. It's not just three individual teams. It's where we're building from the freshman all the way to senior, um, really coming together, supporting each other and building that competitive drive um, to be the best we can. You know, what did it mean to you to come back to your alma mater and start coaching them and building them back up? Oh, it was incredible to be welcomed back and see a lot of my old teachers and stuff. They have that support system and just knowing Skyview is a great school um, and being able to know how good the program can be and work to get us back there and be a part of that. It was an incredible opportunity for me and I'm so blessed to be able to be at my alma mater. Let's jump into the season. Your only losses this year are to Columbia River and Camas. Both teams are ranked in the top 10 in the state. What would your squad need to do to overcome those types of teams? I would say right now our biggest thing is eliminating unforced errors. Um, we we struggle sometimes um, and having to get back, and especially playing great teams like that, um, they're not going to give you free points. So having to be um, as crisp and clean as you can and just play our game and focus on what's happening on our side um, and really coming together and knowing that we can beat those tough teams, it just comes who wants it more and who's gonna play um, outstanding volleyball that day. We've talked about her a couple of times from past matches, but could you describe what Tyra Schaub and some of the upperclassmen have meant to this team? Of course, yeah, Tyra is outstanding. Um, she's a four year varsity starter. Um, so she got there when I got there. So we've had a lot of time together. We've helped build the program together. Um, she's just a great leader. Like she's a presence. You walk into the gym when she's hitting, you know who she is. Like she just has a presence on the court and she fills that role of a leader so well for our team. Um, and she's our go-to when we're in those tough situations and need a score, she's our go-to. Um, so she's done a great job and has grown so much from her freshman year to her senior year. And you can tell this year she just wants it that much more because it's her last season. Um, and I say in general, all of our seniors, we have five seniors and their um, passion to want to go far and compete and leave a legacy at the school has really brought our team together and has that extra push we need to go far. There are about four or five teams in this area that are ranked in the top 25 in the state. What makes this area such a small volleyball hotbed? I would say our club, like we, being so close to Oregon and Washington, we get those opportunities in the club seasons um, for the girls to play with each other, play on those higher elite teams and play um, against all the great girls in the area. So I think our area is special where we have the opportunities of also being in close enough to Oregon to compete and those in the off season. Um, so I think it lends to making our Southwest Washington an elite um, place for volleyball players to grow and um, really come together with the teams in high school to create these awesome competitions and really compete throughout the state. Um, so it's really, it's a really fun place to be for volleyball. Lastly, coach, your team has a tough matchup against Kelso this week. You got the best of the team earlier in the season. How do you top the Highlanders again this week? It's going to be tougher being on the road at their their gym. They bring a lot of energy. They're a team that shows up every day and they bring the energy, whether it's scoring off a free ball or scoring off a major kill. Like they bring tons of energy. So for us, it's going to be showing up to their gym, bringing that same energy. And again, just playing crisp, clean volleyball, playing Skyview volleyball, controlling what's happening on our side. And it's going to be a battle. We know that and we're super excited to see how it all plays out. Coach Swanson, thank you so much for your time and best of luck for the rest of the season. Awesome, thank you so much. The Class 2A Boys Tennis Tournament has just wrapped up at the Vancouver Tennis Center. The winners move on to state. Columbia River's Matt Rudy is the singles winner. Jeffrey Trong from Fort Vancouver finished second. Peyton Yeager from Ridgefield finishes third. And Andrew Field from Fort finished fourth and is an alternate to state. Moving on to doubles, Mikey Nestor and Ryan Gruber from Ridgefield took home the district title. From Columbia River, Cole Benner and Alex Harris took second. And in third, Gavin Kester and Tucker Neep from Washougal. Good luck to all of our local tennis players in the state tournament in Olympia. And now we welcome back onto the show Micah Rice to discuss the recent activity around Clark County. Micah, how are you doing? I'm well, how are you? 
I can't complain. Let's jump into some 2A football action. Both Washougal and Hawkinson picked up wins this past week. It seems like they have a good chance of making the playoffs, but what do you think the chances are for everybody underneath Ridgefield? Well, I think obviously their stories are going to be determined here in the last two weeks of the season. Uh, it's good to see uh, those teams in the running, and, and I think uh, uh, the stakes are high, obviously, with the, uh, uh, the chase for, um, for a postseason berth with those teams in third and fourth place in the, in the league. I think uh, Ridgefield, of course, looks like uh, the overwhelming favorite. They, uh, what they've been doing is, is they've just been wearing teams down and they're running away with games in the second half. They did that this last Friday against Columbia River. And uh, uh, so I think uh, you have Ridgefield pretty solidly in the, in the first spot there. Hawkinson is pretty solidly in that number two spot. But yeah, the stakes are high for, uh, for Mark Morris and Washougal uh, in, the, in the chase for the third and the fourth spots. Meanwhile, we go up a couple of divisions. Skyview made a statement with a big win over Union, and Camus had a huge win over Tumwater. How does that shake things up in 4A? Well, I, I, you know, talk about a statement win for Skyview. I think we all expected uh, that game last Thursday uh, between Skyview and Union to be close. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, Skyview dominating with a 37 to 7 victory. Uh, and uh, they get another test this Friday with a, a game a lot of us have been looking forward to Skyview versus Camus. You mentioned Camus. Um, you know, I, I, I've been saying all season that they were going to be better for the way they started the season with uh, taking on kind of a who's who of Oregon powerhouse high school teams. And so they take those lessons learned, go up and uh, knock off the number one ranked team in 2A, Tumwater. Doesn't matter what classification you're in, uh, Tumwater is always a tough place to play. They might be a 2A school, but they have the numbers of a 4A uh, football uh, program with well more than 100 kids you know, on that roster. And so for the papermakers to go up there and get that win, it re uh, really sets up for an intriguing game this Friday against Skyview. You all remember uh, this last spring, Skyview and Camus went to overtime at Doc Harris Stadium with Skyview, or sorry, with Camus pulling out the narrow victory there. Uh, could it be a repeat of uh, that same type of close matchup with league title uh, app or, uh, implications on the line? I think it could be a, a very competitive game this Friday. Let's move over to the hardwood. We've talked about Columbia River and Ridgefield being at the top of the 2A rankings, but we forget about Mark Morris. River and Ridgefield face off tomorrow, but both play a tough Mark Morris team next week. How do you see the 2A playing out? Well, we're really going to see uh, this week what happens with that. I, I think some of it, if you look at strictly the polls, you know, Ridgefield and Columbia River are right up there. What I'm really interested to see is, is there a gap between Ridgefield and Columbia River? Uh, if there is, I don't think it's that big. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Ridgefield, they haven't dropped a set the entire season. And so if Ridgefield comes out and, and wins again in three sets in the second matchup between those teams, I think you can make the argument that there's a pretty sizable gap between Ridgefield, which has to be the favorite for the two-way state title in volleyball right now. They've won the last, you know, that they're a two-time defending champion, you know, if you don't count this last season, which didn't have a state tournament. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, we've seen, in past years and recent years, teams like Columbia River, uh, you know, get getting on a run and and uh, really challenging the sputters. And so, what I think you're going to see is, you know, is there a tiered system at the top of the two A with Ridgefield, Columbia River, and Mark Morris? Mark Morris, another team that has lost in three sets to teams like Columbia River, but those three sets were tight. If Mark Morris can get a win against either of those programs, then I think you have to look at the Monarchs as being in the mix for uh, uh, being a team to talk about at the district tournament. But if, if uh, Ridgefield ends up running through this uh, week like they have in the past and winning all those matches by 3-0 score lines, then I think uh, you have to look at the sputters as uh, really hitting their stride going yeah, as the postseason gets near. With the fall seasons drawing to a close soon, what are some of the games you'll be keeping an eye on this week? Well, obviously, the, the big one is, is Skyview Camus football, that, like I mentioned before. But we're really going to see, I think, some certainty start to rise in the 3A. Um, uh, last week, Kelso and Mountain View got huge wins on, on, on the gridiron for kind of how that league 
will end up shaking out. Uh, uh, Mountain View gained the win over Prairie to remain uh, alone in the number one spot in the in the three A. But also Kelso, they they had a, a you know a couple of, of really tough games back to back at home, losing to Mountain View and then losing to Skyview. Although <laughs> Skyview, you know, they're for real, and so I don't think anyone will will look at that as, as a bad loss in any means. But Kelso really came back and made a statement with a thoroughly dominating win over Evergreen. And what that does is it allows Kelso now to wrap up at least the two or the second spot in the 3A league if they can win this week against Heritage at home. So what you're going to see, I think, is um, uh, Kelso, they're, you know, the, them versus Heritage is going to be one that I think decides who ends up being the number two seed in that league and then of course if Mountain View happens to trip up then that puts chaos into the mix <laughs> and so uh, uh, I don't know if people it, it depends kind of on, on your outlook are you a fan of chaos or are you a fan of order so things could get interesting near the end that's what we like to hear as for the Colombian your feature story this week is a unique situation coming out of Washougal well, it's not often you get uh, uh, triplets playing for one team, but that's what you have with the Washougal uh, soccer program. The uh, Rabus triplets are all seniors, and uh, in addition to being uh, excellent players in their own right, collectively they have Washougal uh, right there nipping on the heels of the uh, the league leaders. It's it's kind of a log jam at the uh, top of the two-way Greer St. Helens League with girls soccer. Uh, Columbia River has emerged kind of – uh, leading the pack at this point, but right behind them, you have Hawkinson, uh, Ridgefield, and then Washougal, and along with Ari Long in there, kind of uh, making it a really interesting chase in these last couple of weeks for how uh, uh, those postseason bursts are going to be divvied out. So uh, thanks to uh, triplets and the inherent chemistry that, that, that uh, you know, three players who've known each other their whole life and uh, are, you know, bring to that team, the Panthers are right there looking to make some noise heading into the final weeks of the season. Micah, thank you for your time as always, and we'll catch up next week. Of course, you can find Micah and his team of reporters covering local high school sports at Columbian.com. They're also fantastic to follow on Twitter, especially when it comes to game days. There are a bunch of sports broadcasts coming up on Comcast channels 27, 28, 29, and 328 for HD. On Thursday, the 21st, BPS Game Time brings you Washougal versus Columbia River, live from Kiggins Bowl at 7 p.m. The same night, it's Kelso versus Union in girls soccer at 7 p.m., thanks to Evergreen Sports. On Friday, the 22nd, BPS Game Time has football, Hawkinson versus Hudson's Bay at 6. All of these games are also available on the individual district's social media feeds, so check out YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter for links. Hey, let's get social with our top posts of the week. Number one comes from Heritage High School. Check out this game day hype event in the cafeteria. Terry the T-Wolf and the school's cheerleaders are getting the student section pumped up for the big football game. And it worked. Heritage won Friday night 27 to 10. Our next post comes from Fox 12's Friday Night Lights account. They were there for the River Ridgefield matchup on Friday. And this is from the pregame coin flip. Fox 12 does a great job including Southwest Washington and its high school highlights. Finally, a really cool story out of Freeman in the Spokane area. Referee Danny Adams is about to retire, but before he goes, he wanted to make history. On Friday, he was part of the first all-black officiating crew in Spokane area history. Here's what he had to say about it. What does it mean to you to be a part of the first all-black refing uh, squad in Spokane history? It's fantastic. It can't say enough words. You know, this is great. Is this something you ever imagined seeing in your career? No, it isn't, but uh, closer to my retirement, once we got enough gentlemen of color, I wanted it to happen. Congrats to Danny and the rest of the crew for making history. To end the show, here's our Play of the Week. Jaden Jones from Union shows the kind of skill we've been seeing from him all season long. After a bobble on the pass, he scoots through the Skyview defense to get to the goal line and check out this leap across the goal line. That's not easy, folks. Skyview won, but Union's Jaden Jones took home our top play. You should see his name in the all-league team at the end of the year. And that's it for us. We'll be back next week with more highlights and interviews. If you like the show, make sure you share it and find us on social media at Vancouver and Evergreen Public Schools on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Brian Slyke, and we'll see you next week.